So in this video, we're going to talk about a few topics that I find that I find that Dr. K addresses really well. And primarily it's about why you should stop seeking pleasure and why pleasure seeking people usually tend to be desperate. Why pleasure seeking people usually are the ones that have no control over their behavior and over their emotions. So we're going to watch Dr. K react to Dr. K. And as he talks, um, I'm going to let him talk at first. But as he talks, I'm going to butt in and give you guys my take on it. OK, um, if you guys enjoy this type of content, please let me know by clicking on the description down below and commenting and liking and subscribing to the channel because if you don't i'm closing it um and don't forget 50 percent off all of my courses using the coupon code mindful okay okay so let's begin right now motivated enough my life suffers from a lack of motivation all i do is sit at home all day or i want to go to the gym or i want to eat healthy or i want to work harder at work i wish i could study harder but i'm just not motivated enough to do it and I would actually argue that the problem isn't that you're not motivated enough. The problem is that you are too motivated in the wrong direction. Now, look, I know he's talking about motivation, but keep listening. So let's take the case of you sitting at home and doing nothing. So if you sort of think about it, as you try to go and do something, there are very powerful forces for you to overcome for you to do something. Right? You really have to try hard to extract yourself from the computer or TV or whatever. You have to really try extra hard to go to this extra study session or go to office hours with your professor. So if we really look at it, doing things in life requires extra effort. And now you may think that's because I'm not motivated, but if you really pause and think about it, you're highly motivated to continue doing what you're doing. There's a part of your brain that is telling you, hey, we don't want to do that. We actually really want to stay here and watch one more episode of whatever we happen to be binging at the time. Attack on or Titans. queue up for one more video game. Or as you struggle to find the motivation to stop using social media, there's a part of your brain that's like, no, 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 my friend. We are not going to stop. We are actually highly motivated to continue doing what we're doing. Let's take a quick look at the neuroscience and see if this kind of pans out because it absolutely does. In order to understand how to become less motivated, and these are the bad motivations that we have, we've got to start by understanding the neuroscience of motivation. Motivation comes from the nucleus accumbens of our brain. The nucleus accumbens governs reward, behavioral reinforcement, and motivation. So basically the way this works is I try something, and depending on how pleasurable it is, I get a spurt of dopamine in my nucleus accumbens. If my nucleus accumbens get some dopamine, it says, okay, this thing feels good. It feels pleasurable. Therefore, let us reinforce the behavior. And if we stop- And, 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 and you know what's funny is that um, Dr. K was actually talking about in many videos before this, that people who have addictive personalities, they feel pleasure at a higher level. In other words, if you have somebody who has ADD, autism, um, or people who have addictive personalities, needy people, people who didn't receive their love they deserved when they were children. A lot of them, their dopamine receptors, when it receives any pleasure, goes on overdrive. Like, the pleasure that somebody who has an addictive personality gets from the same stimulus that a normal person does is a lot higher. And then the level of pain that somebody like this has compared to somebody who's normal is a lot deeper too. So not only do they feel more pain, but also they feel more pleasure. So you can see how there are intense forces going up against the people who usually might, people might consider to be needy, desperate. A lot of the times it's just the way that their brains are wired. They just find pleasure in a lot of things very intensely and they find loneliness or negative experiences more intensely and so it creates a problem and that's why a lot of them just walk around with around with anxiety um they fear to lose what they have and then they fear to be alone um let's keep listening and think about what does behavioral reinforcement mean it basically means motivate to do it again right so if i play a particular video game and i have lots of fun i will get a lot of dopamine and then i will be motivated to play it again the other important part of the nucleus accumbens is that it is also very sensitive to pain. So not only does it help us seek pleasure, it also is very, very sensitive to avoiding pain. There you go. That, is, that too. Well, because usually 
like I said, somebody who has an addictive personality has a higher, has a lower threshold for, for pain. So the same boredom that you might feel to somebody like this, the boredom is like twice more intensely. And so they are, they are, they're, the strategies that they use to not feel bored can seem more ex extreme to a, to a normal person. This is exactly why we're highly motivated to do nothing, right? So if there's a task that you're procrastinating on, like, hey, I need to email my professor for an extension, you're concerned that the professor may think something bad about you, may say no, that you may really be screwed. And in the avoidance of that pain, your nucleus accumbens is like, whoa, 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 buddy. Why would you engage in that conversation that could end badly when we can queue up for another game, right? And then we can get that dopamine and it's totally fine. And so if we think about our internal struggle to do the things that you should do instead of doing the things that you're motivated to do, what we find is that it comes down to the nucleus accumbens. So you watch my videos, you know you're not supposed to do that, but the, the emotional drive is so intense that your amygdala, your reptilian brain will literally hijack your prefrontal cortex. In other words, it'll hijack your logic. Your emotions will hijack your logic. And people who have a more of a negative attachment style, people who are more, who have addictive personalities, people who've been traumatized, which is a lot of people, a lot of them, they have, they have more of that like, like it's it's almost like imagine like this, it's imagine it's tsunami right where the tsunami is your emotions and the land, and the land is your rational brain right the more intense the earthquake the bigger the tsunami and some people just have bigger earthquakes in their minds they just have they react to things more exaggerated and a lot of the times the best way to overcome that is to is to find a way to stabilize the the amygdala and studies have shown that meditation reduces the activity of the amygdala and increases the activity of the prefrontal cortex and gives you, quote unquote, troops by increasing gray matter, which gives you more pathways to create more connectivity in the prefrontal cortex so that it doesn't get overdriven by the amygdala. Now, how do we break free of this? How do we actually decrease our motivation? Now, this is what's really cool. There's another source of happiness in our brain that's referred to by the term eudaimonics. So when you kind of think about happiness, there's two terms that kind of come up and they come from different parts of the brain. The first is hedonics. So this is pleasure. This comes from the uh, nucleus accumbens. And this is like, you know, pleasure seeking, like games are fun. Booze is fun. Pot is fun. Dancing is fun. Sex yeah, is fun. I've, I've, yeah, I've, 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 I've experienced both extremes. Fun, like all this stuff is fun, right? It's pleasurable. But then if we look at happiness and contentment, this is actually governed by a completely different part of the brain. This is what we call eudaimonics, and it's governed by this part called the insula. And the primary like neurotransmitter involved is also serotonin. So we've got kind of the dopamine system and we've got the serotonin system. Now, the interesting thing about eudaimonics is the subjective experience of eudaimonics is that you're kind of chill, you're vibing, you're content. You feel generally happy with life. Now, the really interesting thing is that the... And that's... People who have addictive personality, people who are needy are do dopamine driven people, right? And so a lot of them never really experience that type of eudynamic type of pleasure where they find pleasure in being alive and, and just being. The problem is that their brain is so, uh, so, so geared towards averging, averting pain and going towards pleasure that they never they they don't find this type of pleasure comfortable so they always have to have some type of drama in their lives um where hedonistic people or eudonistic people they'll find satisfaction in simplicity he's, he's gonna talk about it these two things are antagonistic yeah so yeah, yeah. there you go there you go thing is that these two things are antagonistic so if you look at someone who's highly dopaminergic and their life is governed by the nucleus accumbens they have very powerful motivations. Oh my God, I, I need to get up and I need to hop on the computer. I need to hop on my phone. I need to use technology. I need to do this thing a lot. And then generally speaking, if you ask them, how content are you in life? How happy are you in life? They will say low. Mm -hmm. Now, if we flip it around. That, that, that's a lot. You see that a lot in, in big liberal cities, honestly. Like, 
Like, um, this is, and this is the difference between liberal city and conservative cities. Like liberals, it's all about you. You know, a lot of them are um, hedonistic. You know, Berlin, Jesus Christ. If, you, if, you, if you're a therapist there, you're going to make a lot of money. But then you have conservative cities that they don't really have a lot of parties. They don't drink a lot. They don't do a lot of drugs, you know, relatively. Well, in the classical term, right? Um, and they're more into getting married, having a family, and having a simple nine to five. And it looks boring. Don't get me wrong. Like, it looks boring. But if you ask them how satisfied they are, you're going to have a higher level of happiness in people who have more of us who have the same routine they might say they're bored but i can promise you if you ask them how unhappy you are they're going to say they're happier than the liberals because liberals live more of a hedonist um hedonistic lifestyle and i don't care how much you try to convince me hedon hedonism never leads to happiness it leads to pleasure though and we take someone who is highly eudaimonic and we ask them what's your life like they kind of wake up and they're sort of chill and they're kind of vibing they're like life is good and then if you ask them, what do you want to do today? They'll be like, whatever you want to do is fine. They're not, their brain is not sort of honing in on, I need this pleasure and I need to avoid this pain. People who are highly eudaimonic are also more resilient. Like we said, it kind of relates somewhat to serotonin. And what we understand is that boosting serotonin signals in the brain will improve things like depression and anxiety. So if we sort of think about someone who's eudaimonic and kind of chilling and content, they're less depressed, they're less anxious, and they're kind of going about living their day. But also they experience less quote unquote hedonistic pleasure. So their sex life is great, but you know, it's not crazy. You know, they, they, they don't eat out every day, they cook every day. You know, their life is not boring, but it could be a little interesting. And so that mid-level of happiness is, it is a sweet spot. That's just, a, it is a sweet spot. But unfortunately, like any other animal, if you give any any animal a gateway to easy pleasure, they all will turn hedonistic. All of them, even monkeys. Give a monkey a, a smoke and a beer. Give a monkey a cigarette and a beer and that, that monkey is gonna turn into a Karen. That monkey is gonna be smoking and drinking cigarette. Smoking and drinking and drinking beer, right? It's like any, give any animal that and all of them will get into that path, right? Um, not all of them, right? You're gonna have your like freaking messiah chimp that doesn't do that shit, right? But generally speaking, um, animals, all almost all animals are prone to get addicted, but they just never got have access to it. And so now what we really need to do is understand, okay, how do we make this shift from hedonics in the nucleus accumbens to eudaimonics and sort of being generally content. Let's see what he says. Now, this is where, thankfully, we've got a really, really, really good technique that comes from uh, yoga. The so yogis. A couple thousand years ago, you had the a group yogis of yogis discovered. And monks and people like that, right? And you have all these people like, um, you know, who will talk about how meditation makes them happier and more content and boosts willpower. How does that work? What the yogis basically figured out is that the attachment to pleasure and the avoidance of pain come hand in hand. If I'm going to get a lot of pride from a success, I'm also opening myself up to devastation from failure. Well, yeah, like celebrities, right? Like they get you're going to get all the praise, but as soon as you fail, you're also going to get all the criticism, even if it's unfair. Here. And so what the yogis decided that we're going to do is we're going to detach from all of that crap. We're going to separate ourselves from the hedonics. And then what happened when they started doing these yogic practices? They became more eudaimonic. They started to become more content. And as they got better and better than that, at that, they even attained states called enlightenment, which is- I've, I've experienced it. I never experienced enlightenment, but I've definitely experienced a, a, a significant amount of reduction of my desire for pleasure and my aversion to pain especially after the meditation retreat. It was more evident like a few weeks, a few days after the retreat, like I could literally sense how finding that middle path is life. And, and look at me now, right? If you notice where I live right now, I'm in a very quiet area of Mexico. Anyone who knows me knows I don't fucking live in quiet places. I don't, I don't do that shit. I don't live in quiet places. I hate living in quiet places. Now I don't mind. My routine has has simplified when it before it used to be a 
freaking chaotic mess in ways that you can't imagine. So it's, it's, it's very true. When you meditate, you just become less drama. You become less, you become more drama free. Is a period of sort of persistent happiness and contentment. And you may sort of wonder, like, how is that possible? It's because their eudaimonics are through the roof. They're kind of chilling, vibing with whatever happens. So how do we make this shift? So the yogis give us a couple of good tips. The first is that they used to do practices like fasting or the deprivation of positive stimuli. What I do is every day I try to meditate one hour. Sometimes I do 55 minutes. Sometimes I do 50. Sometimes I do one hour. But every day in the morning, before I make a video, I have to do meditation. It's like I just, I, even if I don't want to, I'm just, the lesson just fucking sit and don't move, motherfucker. Like, don't move. Even if I don't want to, I just sit my butt down. Like, that's the key. Sit and close your eyes. That's it. That's it. That's all you do. If after 10 minutes you don't want to go, okay, that's fine. But sit your butt down. And because what you're doing is that you're giving yourself boredom on purpose. So that when it's time to do things, things are more pleasurable. That's like the natural drug. If you want to have a natural drug, bore yourself out of your mind for a short while. And then do something fun. And you'll notice how it's more fun. Now, this is where we misunderstand really what the benefit of this is. When people do things like fasting, we think it's about willpower. It's not actually about willpower. It's about observing your life in the absence of a pleasurable thing. So let in me other words, observing who you are in its raw and unfiltered state. Be all an example. So when I was in an ashram, right? So when I first went to study yoga, the food there sucked, right? So it's like ashram food. It's like monastery food. It's the same kind of gruel. I was actually nauseous. I could barely choke it down. And I longed for the foods that I wanted. The nucleus accumbens of my brain that wants that dopamine from that double fisting of a beer in one hand and a Coke in the other and a slab of pizza in front of me is like, oh my God, I don't want to eat this rice gruel day after day after day after day. This sucks so much. And then as I continued with the deprivation, I wasn't starving myself or anything. I started to realize, oh, actually, like I can actually find happiness despite the fact that I don't get my material desires fulfilled. After a week goes by, after two weeks go by, I'm kind of like, this is okay. So one thing that you can do is abstain from some kind of pleasurable thing. Now, the goal of this abstinence isn't to actually boost your willpower, although that can happen. The goal of this abstinence is for you to pay attention to what happens to your sense of contentment. Is your life absolutely miserable without a slice of pizza or without beer or without marijuana. You'd be surprised, Dr. K. It, it, it does feel miserable. Like, it, it really does. I'm not even going to lie. Um, but like, when I did that meditation retreat, I, I, there, was, there were points where I just wanted to get the fuck out. Like, I was miserable. Um, but through the meditation process, what happens is that your capacity to handle miserable, miserable experiences is the reason why you feel better when you're out of that meditation. You learn to accept a boring, miserable situation and you sort of see normal life as like a piece of cake because this doesn't compare to that, right? I know, I, I, look, sometimes we in the meditation retreat, we, we said, look, man, if, when we're telling people about this retreat, don't tell them how, how, how miserable we were because they won't come. And it is true. Like, but people, you're paying a price. You're paying a price for something that has no, no, no worth. You're paying a price to literally grow an extra limb, and that limb has the has control over your emotions. You're literally able to control your emotions, people. You talk about a powerful tool, and you talk about something that's worth the price. That's worth the price. That's worth what I went through. You may experience all kinds of negative things, but really pay attention to that and start to see what happens to your life. Honestly, sometimes I just think about, I cannot believe I actually did that. <laughs> like, I'm just so happy I got it. I got it through, man. I, like, honestly, people, like, I would have, like, I just cannot believe I actually did that meditation retreat, man. That, it still blows my mind to this day. When you deprive yourself of this thing. Now, what's going on in the brain when you do this? 
What's going on is that we are not feeding the nucleus accumbens. Because remember, when the nucleus accumbens get something pleasurable, spurt of dopamine, behavioral reinforcement, stronger motivation the next day. So we're sort of quieting down the nucleus accumbens. Now, the problem with that technique is that it's pretty tough, but I would recommend, um, you know, giving something up that you find somewhat pleasurable but like it's not going to be life-changing yeah i mean it's it is hard but like again I, the way i say it is that it's easier if you do it in a group that's why you want to go to a retreat because you're meditating in a group and you're both and you're all suffering humans tap into their superpowers when they do things with other people that's just how that works if you do it with other people you're going to notice you're going to be able to actually do it um, but if you do this meditation, if you do this deprivation alone, you could do it. Don't get me wrong. Like I, like I used to do, I used to have um, spiritual um, fastings for like a day, two or three, where I wouldn't eat food for two or three days. I used to do that by myself. It's, but that's because I thought I was going to help people. Okay, so that's a little, that's a different motivation. Um, this, if you want to do this and you try doing it by yourself, it's always better to do it in a group. In the group, you have a high likelihood of succeeding in doing this type of deprivation. So in my case, I gave up ice cream for 10 years and that worked really, really well. It was awesome, really helped me a lot. Next thing, I know, 10 years, right? It's, honestly, it's not that bad. That's the whole fucking point of the exercise. You do it for a while, you're like, hey, this ain't so bad. I can live totally fine and I can be completely happy. You don't sound convinced. Of my life you don't sound convinced. Of one of my favorite things. Second thing that we can do is dissect pleasure. Now, this is the key thing that they sort of understood that we miss out a lot in, in life. So right now, everyone is all for avoiding pain, right? Because pain sucks and that's bad and we don't want to embrace pain. We don't want to fast. We don't want to deprive ourselves of anything. You see your nucleus accumbens? It's like, no, 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 no. We're highly motivated to not give up ice cream. Don't take that pleasure away from me. And it's going to drive you. You see that motivational pull? It's happening right now. I don't want to give anything up, which is fine. You don't have to. So this is the cool thing. You can not only embrace the negative, but you can also detach from the positive. Now, this may be where, once again, your nucleus accumbens is freaking out. Does this mean he's going to tell me, like, I shouldn't do fun things? No, no, no. I said detach from, not abstain from. So what does it mean to detach from the positive? What this means is to dissect your pleasure, right? Observe your pleasure from the outside. So as you eat a slice of pizza or have some ice cream, take a look at what's going on inside you where in my body does this pleasure come from you know now, it, it's find... it's funny because like i did this i do it with weed and when i smoke and i notice that the pleasure of smoking weed is a lot less when i do it consciously there's something about just allowing the pleasure to just make you unconscious like you just like and you just start smoking and just letting the movie get you and and you're just reveling in the high but if you actually stay present, notice your breath as you're smoking weed, you'll notice that the pleasure of the high is not as pleasurable. You know, it's not as pleasurable. And experiencing that high in that state, in that level of pleasure over time will reduce the attachment to it. The problem is that you're going to notice a part of you is going to resist. A part of you is not going to like the fact that it's not getting the full pleasure that it wants. So it's easier said than done for a lot of people, right? Um, it's like me telling you, eat. it's like you have a burger and I tell you to eat it without watching your favorite TV show. It's not the same. You're like, come on, man, let me watch Maury. You're like, no, nah, no, nah, eat consciously. And you're like, fuck, all right. And you finish eating. You're like, man, it was great, but man, I could have been watching Maury, man. Now imagine if you're watching Maury, right? And you're eating your food. Are you really tasting the food as much? No, you're not right? You're, you're feeling pleasure because you're watching TV and eating, but you're not really experiencing the food. That's the point. You're experiencing your imagination in, 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 in a weird way. Um, it's like you're double fisting it. <laughs> Horrible analogy, but it's almost the same thing here, right? You're, you're allowing yourself to be present and to bring an addictive behavior, an unconscious behavior which is usually done unconsciously and you're doing it with consciousness. It's almost like saying, okay, hey, dude, who's taking a shit? Take a shit in front of everyone. And he's like, what? So yeah, take a shit, but make sure to take a shit and make sure everyone watches. He's like, no, I don't want to do that. He's like, you were doing it in private. Do it right now. He's like, 
that's fucking embarrassing. I don't want to do that. That's almost the same thing with your addictions. They want to stay in the in the in the shadows. And if you bring them out to the light, they'll perform, but you'll notice that over time the attachment, the 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 power it had over you will decrease is that as you start to observe and dissect your pleasure, the thing will become less pleasurable. There you go. I, people, I did not watch this. I did not watch this. <laughs> I swear to God. I watched up until the three or four minute mark, but this part I did not watch. I'll give you all just a simple example. Back <laughs> in the day, before I went on my monk training, I was 19 years old. I was in my college dorm and I was living a hedonistic glorious lifestyle. Oh, please stop it, Dr. K. You don't seem like that. I would order fried rice uh. two pounds at a time to save on delivery charges. And I would just gorge myself on soda and fried rice for 24 hour gaming binges while I was playing Diablo. And man, I was completely unconscious, but it was just some sort of orgasmic gaming degenerate experience. No awareness and so hedonic. Yeah. And it ruined my life. And 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 that non-awareness, like I said, is usually you detach from your body. You're almost like going into an imaginary imaginary world. And the key to get into that imaginary world is to detach yourself from your body, because that's the only way you could experience hedonism at its fullest. You, you can't be hedonistic and in your body. That's that. Trust me, anyone who is who's doing anything hedonistic, they'll you'll notice it. it it's not as fun when you are, it's like a sober thought. You're not like something sobering or like, imagine you're drunk and then you see the cops, right? You're like, oh, the cops. And you're not as, you, you're more conscious. And that consciousness doesn't allow for you to feel the full pleasure of the drunkenness. Does that make sense? Instead, what I want you all to do is just dissect it, right? So just pay attention to what about this is fun. And what you'll discover is that the less aware you are, the more lost you are in the stuff, the more hedonic reinforcement you'll get. So as you observe pleasurable things, instead of get lost in them, the pleasure you receive from them will start to decrease a little. And that's the problem is that some people, they, 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 they will experience this and they just don't want to do that. They want to feel the pleasure. That's the, you know, and that's their ego. If they actually observe that resistance to not feel that pleasure, they'll notice it's the ego. And, that, and, and, and that's, why I'm, that's, why, that's why I'm saying people are addicted to their pain. They don't even know it. But the cool thing is that as you decrease that pleasure, your eudaimonics will actually increase. So we know from studies of mindfulness is that when we do any activity mindfully, our nucleus accumbens gets less activity. It's less painful, right? So we'll use this for mindfulness for things like cancer-related pain. So it reduces the pain we experience. And it even reduces the hedonic pleasure we experience. But what it does is it boosts our contentment. So this is exactly what we want to do. Because I think contentment is different from pleasure, right? Where you're never fully please you're never fully completely because you're that it's 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 always going to come up again contentment it feels to me contentment is more of a longer lasting type of feeling but it just feels different it's almost like i always see uses use this analogy to explain things that have a similar sensation but also feels fundamentally different it's like the cold of the of the of 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 outside versus the cold of a refrigerator they both feel different. It's a different cold. You could sense the difference. We, we all could sense the difference between cold outside and the cold that's manufactured. Or, or we could tell the difference between the heat that's outside versus the heat that's manufactured by your heater. Completely different, right? So it's almost like that same thing where it's similar, but it's not. It's like animals that look similar, but they're not of the same species or not even related. Like you, call that, you call that cross evolution when animals have evolved to look similar and have very similar body parts, but they have zero ancestors and or zero connection. Yogis have given us an answer, which is to dissect the pleasure. Just observe it. As much pleasure you want to engage in, go for it, but just observe where the pleasure comes from and it'll blunt that nucleus accumbens response. Blunt it. 
The last thing that I want to leave y'all with is sort of this core understanding that the yogis came to, that motivation is a bad thing. So I want y'all to think about this for a second. The more motivated you are, the harder it is to make a choice. Because if we think about what is motivation, I'm motivated, I'm driven, right? So we'll even use the word I'm driven to whatever because I'm highly motivated. So if you sort of think about it, who's in control when you're highly motivated? I've worked with CEOs who are so motivated to work really hard, they've gotten married and divorced three separate times. <laughs> I've literally had to take patients who had eating. Well, it, like isn't isn't every negative addiction a motivation as well? You know what I'm saying? Well, that's the thing, actually, because if you're motivated to find pleasure, you're also going to be motivated to to avoid pleasure. So it comes down to discipline more than motivation. OK, let's see if he says that disorders who were so motivated to avoid food that they had to be strapped into a hospital bed and hooked up with IVs so they don't have heart arrhythmias and die. This is the power of motivation. But when we get highly motivated, we lose all control. So the crazy thing is that as you move away from motivation, what you start to get in return is choice. And now I want y'all to think back to a time where you just had a good day, where you woke up in the morning and you weren't particularly motivated. Now, we're not talking about motivated to sit down and start playing games like the first thing when you wake up. We're talking about truly content. And then you can kind of do whatever you want to that day. If someone suggests, hey, do you want to go for a hike? And you're like, yeah, that's fine. I can do that. Or you can wake up and you're feeling relatively content. You're like, ah, let me just go ahead and take care of this work. And there isn't this internal struggle. Mm. So the crazy thing that the yogis ended up discovering is that motivation and choice are also antagonistic. And the more that you boost your insula, the more that your serotonin signal increases, the more eudaimonic you become, the more freedom you have in life. That contentment and freedom actually come hand in hand. So I know it sounds bizarre and I know that- Yeah, it, it's crazy. It, it, it really is. It really is because then then that means you just have more choices. You're not bound to what motivates you. You're you're bound by what you choose to be disciplined to. If that makes any sense, right? Because a lot of these successful people, a lot of the times what 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 drives them to be successful is also what drives them to to be unhappy. It's what makes them miserable. And at the end of the day, people, it's all about happiness. I don't care how successful you are. If you're not happy, you're, you're not successful, right? Um, we're going to end it right here. Um, and, and I hope you guys enjoyed this video on why you got to stop seeking pleasure. Stop seeking pleasure, people. Seek contentment. Um, and if you guys enjoy this type of content, reviewing psycholo psychologists, because he, he's a psychiatrist, Dr. K, um, let me know in the comments down below. I will be posting stuff like this on Patreon. And yeah, I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye. And don't forget, man, 50% off. Use